Hi, welcome back to SQL Server 2016 Administration. This is the High Availability and Disaster Recovery module. In this module, we'll start talking about what High Availability and Disaster Recovery actually mean. And then we'll go into clustering, which is the first and most common use for high availability technologies that are available in SQL Server. Next, we'll move to availability groups, which were introduced in recent versions of SQL Server. This gives us high availability at the database level, but with multiple databases. We'll then step back to database mirroring, which has been around for quite some time and allows us to protect a single database. We'll move on to log shipping, which has been around as long as SQL Server has existed. And this allows us to perform some disaster recovery processes to protect our data. And lastly, we'll look at replication, which is really a data movement technology, but it can be considered a disaster recovery technology as well. This is the high availability and disaster recovery module. We're talking about clustering. In this video, we're going to talk about how disaster recovery actually differs from high availability. These are two different concepts. We'll talk about what a SQL Server cluster means in SQL Server 2016. And then we'll look at how to set up and manage a cluster. Let's first start talking about high availability. High availability is actually the practice of ensuring that whatever system we have, it's available to clients as much as possible, or it's highly available. What this means is that if we have a failure, we have another system that can take over whatever workload there's there and process transactions. It could be easily about, you know, managing database transactions, could be file server transactions, whatever it is, we want to ensure that the system comes back up, it's available for clients to use. Now the techniques we use for HA or high availability are different than those we use for disaster recovery. And these techniques are designed to ensure that the services are just available and that clients can use them. Not that any of the data or any of the processes are actually intact over time. That's a different type of process we want to handle. Disaster recovery is the other side of the coin here. And disaster recovery is ensuring that we can recover the systems and data in the event of some failure. Usually it's an unexpected failure that we're just, we can't plan for. We're not sure about. We have a hurricane, we have a major hack, some other kind of issue. Now, as we noted in a backup module, the disaster impacts the availability of systems and it potentially could cause data loss. And disaster recovery techniques are designed to help us try to minimize data loss and deal with the availability of systems over time. Typically, we're working with longer lasting issues than with high availability, which are usually on the order of seconds or minutes. Disaster recovery could be days or hours or something like that. Now, our disaster recovery plans and our techniques are driven by the RPO and the RTO requirements. We talked about these in the backup module, but these help us determine how we respond to different sorts of disaster. Now, keep in mind that there are some issues that are better handled by DR, not HA, such as corruption, or data errors, user errors, those kinds of things. HA is about usually hardware errors, trying to ensure that systems are always available. If a network path, if a disk drive, if a computer server fails, we have something else to take that place. Now let's move on to talk about clustering, which is really an HA technology. And the reason it is because we have one copy of the data always available, and so we're trying to ensure that it's highly available from multiple computers. We build SQL Server clustering on Windows Server Failover Clustering, or WSFC. And WSFC allows multiple nodes to group themselves together and provide a single view of some service or some role. It could be SQL Server, it could be Exchange, it could be SharePoint. There's a variety of items that can run as a cluster. An FCI, or Failover Clustered Instance, is a single SQL Server instance that appears to the client as one instance, but it can run on any of the nodes that are available. Note that the FCI is only active on one node at a time. Let's look at this in a topology diagram. So over to the right, I have a client. In the middle, I have my clustered instance, which I'm calling SQL FCI. You'll notice there's a single database here. I've got these other items here, but we'll talk about those briefly. Now, when a client connects to the SQL Server, they would connect to SQL FCI, or that clustered instance, whatever I've named it. And that actually allows us to present a database that a client can query. But it's not actually the database they're querying. They're querying the actual storage physical database that exists on disk. But in reality, what's happening is that one of these nodes is controlling that storage. In this case, SQL01 is. When the client connects, their request is really handled by SQL01, which is presenting itself as SQL FCI. Note that there are only two real nodes here, SQL01 and SQL02. SQL FCI is a virtual node that's exposed by the cluster. Now, in the event that SQL01 were to fail for some reason, we turn it off, we perform maintenance or hardware failure, whatever happens, client gets ready to connect, SQL02 will have taken over the presentation of SQL FCI and will control that same physical shared storage sandbox database. So those same files, the MDF, LDF, and NDF files that make up the database will be under the control of SQL02. So this time when a client connects, 
they will actually be served by SQL02, even though they think they're working with SQL FCI. It may sound a little confusing, but it is in fact uh, a technology that makes a lot of sense. Now, when that failover occurs, when we move around, what actually happens is the SQL services stop on one node and start on a different node. And that takes a certain amount of time because just like you reboot in your computer, it takes some time for those services to start. It's a predictable amount of time though. And you just have to be aware that this is a restart of a SQL server. All the instance functions move to the new node, which means that both nodes have to be configured exactly the same. Pathing setup, all that is the same. And that's how the client actually sees it. They see it as one node and SQL Server handles the movement with Windows clustering. Now, keep in mind that not all SQL Server subsystems are cluster aware like SSIS, so they would have to be installed or handled in a different way for high availability. Let's take a look and see how an FCI is configured. For the purposes of the demonstration, I built this lab in Azure. So I built a cluster in Azure. Now I'll put this on my blog so that people can find it, but you'll see that I've got a number of items here. I've got uh, some storage accounts at the top, got a load balancer in place. I have a domain controller, which I do need for clustering. And I've got a few virtual machines here. In this case, SQL 01 and SQL 03 and actually SQL 04 with various things. This is a lot of setup that's involved. So keep in mind that I'll make clustering look a little simple, but it's actually a fairly complex setup. Let's take a look at the actual cluster. Now here's SQL 04. This is a brand new machine. It's joined to the domain. It's ready to go, but I haven't actually installed clustering. I have to install that as a Windows feature, which I'm doing in PowerShell here. You can do this with Server Manager as well, but you have to add the clustering system to Windows and then you'll join the cluster. We'll let this run in the background. And we'll take a look at another system. Now here's SQL 01 and we have the failover cluster manager. The cluster is actually posed as a Windows level item. You'll notice it's got one role and two nodes. The role is SQL Server. So SQL Server is cluster aware and it's, it's registered itself with the Windows cluster. And it's exposed. And you'll notice right now that it's running on SQL 03. Here's my services. I'm on SQL 01 right now. I've got my BG info here, so I'm on SQL 01. If I were to try to move this, what would happen is it would stop the services and start them and move to another node. Before I do that, let's connect from our domain controller. Here I am on the domain controller. You'll notice I'm connecting with TCP to SQL FCI. So we'll make that connection. And I've got a small script here. So I'm going to use the database. I've inserted some data in there and then I'm getting this server property, which gives me the actual physical name. Even though I'm connected to SQL FCI, SQL 03 is where that's running. Let's add a piece of data over here. Once we do that, we'll see that this is still there. And now let's fail over our cluster. To do that, I'm going to return to SQL 01. I'm going to right click this and I'm going to move. Now I've only got two nodes here, so I only have the option to move to one node. And you'll notice that things go offline here. And what will happen in a moment, if I refresh here, is we'll see the SQL services will actually start on this machine. And that's because the cluster is slowly moving over the, the items. So here we see the SQL server services starting, the agent will start, everything else will start in a minute. Once everything comes online and this is running, we should see everything running here. And if I return to my domain controller, let's reconnect because we actually had a SQL Server service failure, so the connections and all the transactions would have dropped just like the machine had dropped. What happens is if I have retry logic, I can reconnect to the virtual instance and then I'll get the view of the SQL Server just as it was before. Networking took a minute to reconnect, so I paused this. We've now reconnected. If I would actually query now, what we'll see is that we're actually on SQL 01. Let's run the rest of our queries here and we'll notice we have that same data from this insert here, even though we're running on SQL 01. To SQL Server, to clients, this looks like just any other SQL Server instance. I have all of the things that I would expect here. I have my SQL agent, I have my management. All of the items that exist here would be the same. If I look at each of these instances though, and let's flip over to one, what we have is there's a clustered volume here. So my cluster storage here, we've got a virtual disk that's called SQL data. And this exists on both nodes. So if I look here, I have my databases. And if I look here, I have my backups. This same information would be over on the other instance as well. And so if I were to connect to my O3 instance, which is here, and I were to look here as well, we would see the same structure because it's the same physical disk that's being presented to both nodes. Only one service owns these files at a time, but it's being presented to both nodes at a time. Again here, this was running a minute ago. 
If I refresh this, these services have been shut down because I failed over the node. There's a lot more to clustering, and as we can see in my lab, it's kind of complex in how you set it up. There's a lot of work to do, but it is a very valuable technique for ensuring that your SQL Server instance is available in the event of any disaster.